Okay. Uh, once again, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of your uh, our colleagues uh, in uh, the SOFIA Symposium of Infertility and Reproductive Health. Um, I am so honored and uh, so pleased to be uh, speaking to all of you from maybe thousands of miles uh, sitting here in my office uh, in Cleveland Clinic in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, United States. Let me first thank uh, uh, Professor Atanis uh, Shatrev. I don't know whether I'm saying his name correctly, uh, but he has been very kind to uh, invite me uh, to speak uh, at your uh, uh, big meeting, and uh, I am very grateful. I also want to thank uh, the moderators uh, for this uh, very nice introduction by uh, Professor Ivanka Dimova uh, and your colleague uh, for, uh, for myself. So um, thank you uh, once again. And uh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, many things uh, about our work in um, uh, understanding the role of uh, antioxidant or nutraceuticals uh, in male infertility because this area is uh, has a lot of uh, conflicting controversial information and uh, it uh, really confuses uh, uh, many of uh, our colleagues uh, who are trying to uh, look at uh, this as a as a suitable option for patients who have male infertility so let me begin. Uh, this is a brief introduction, which you already heard. I am uh, working here at the Cleveland Clinic for almost 29 years now. And before that, for about 10 years, I was at Harvard Medical School in Boston. And uh, my interest is uh, really in the area of uh, male infertility. And, uh, and uh, certainly antioxidant is uh, one of the uh, area of great interest for, uh, for our program. So let's uh, begin. Um, I, I think uh, this is uh, a news item a uh, few months ago that uh, uh, talks about uh, how the sperm count is, is shrink is going down. There is a, a variety of uh, changes in our society. Uh, which is uh, leading to uh, a decline in the fertility of male population, male uh, reproduction. And this is not based on just uh, a news item, but this is based on very good science and studies that have been published in uh, very high impact journals such as Human Reproduction and so many others. So there are uh, uh, so many changes that uh, we are seeing, and this has happened over the last 20 years, that is leading uh, into a explosion of uh, uh, problems of uh, male fertility, whether it is uh, changes in our, uh, in our uh, culture, in our societies, whether it is in West or whether it is in the East, uh, uh, most uh, men and women are waiting uh, until the age of 30, 35, in the case of men, maybe even 40, and sometimes they don't even marry. So this is uh, certainly uh, causing uh, uh, a changes in their reproductive pattern and uh, makes it harder for them to, to achieve uh, pregnancy or have successful pregnancy, as uh, many, many studies have shown that uh, uh, fertility declines with the uh, advances in age, both in uh, female, which is very clear cut, uh, but also in male. And that there is uh, a decline in semen quality, which is happening across the board in all parts of the world. There are large studies that have been conducted all over the globe uh, in many different parts of the world, which is showing that there is uh, a decline in semen quality, uh, whether it is in France, whether it is in Europe, uh, in some other parts of Europe or in Asia, uh, but there are hundreds of studies which are showing that there is a decline. And there was a big study which was published in Human Reproduction a few years ago, which shows there is almost 50 to 60% decline in semen quality, whether it is concentration, motility, morphology, volume, uh, in uh, in men 
in uh, reproductive age men uh, over the last uh, 50, 60 years. And that there is an explosion of uh, sexually transmitted diseases of all kind, gonorrhea, chlamydia, urea plasma in uh, young reproductive age men and uh, environmental causes such as use of phthalates and pesticide and endocrine disruptors uh, is uh, really all over the place. And they are uh, known to have long-term health effect, not only on our reproduction, but on many parts of our body. Then now occupational exposure with the advances in the in the uh, West, uh, industrialization of most of the most of the uh, populations in different parts of the world, uh, there comes uh, pollution, uh, which uh, and the uh, which is a big big uh, issue. And uh, as you are seeing changes in uh, in climate, uh, which uh, is uh, already being experienced in uh, our life. Uh, all over the world, in different uh, parts of the world, there is uh, changes which are linked to um, to various types of environmental pollution, uh, air pollution uh, of all kinds, uh, whether it is industrial, whether it is related to um, automobile or airplane or uh, any kinds of things. Uh, and then uh, there is a lifestyle factors, such as uh, people not moving enough, going around and uh, uh, walking and uh, doing exercise, uh, not because of the pandemic, even before that, uh, our lifestyle has really become more sedentary. People like to just stay at home, watch television, and just uh, not uh, um, have the habit, especially among the young people, to, to go out and talk and walk in the park and things like that. So what it is doing is that uh, it is leading to an explosion of obesity. And uh, it is uh, in some parts of the world, uh, almost uh, 70 to 80% of the young population are obese and sometimes even uh, severely obese. Uh, the cell phone uh, is, uh, uh, generates electromagnetic radiation. We have published studies in this regard uh, infertility, sterility, and many other journals. And then many, many people have published uh, the harmful effects of uh, radiation, excessive use of cell phone can cause. And then there is a stress, psychological stress, alcohol use, smoking, unhealthy diet. These are things which uh, are also leading to an increase uh, in male infertility, diabetes, erectile dysfunction are many are other causes which are leading to this rise in male infertility besides uh, uh, the traditional causes such as varicose seal, infection, uh, obstruction, and trauma. So many of these uh, causes uh, are, are treatable. Uh, as you see here, some can be treated by surgery, and uh, in terms of uh, lifestyle and other uh, medication, these are reversible causes. So if uh, uh, a person is counseled to make some changes uh, in their lifestyle, uh, some of the harmful effects can be reversed. Uh, let's talk about antioxidant and, uh, and male infertility now. Uh, according to the WHO, uh, and this is an old report, as you can see, almost 20 year old, uh, there have been uh, more than almost close to 200 million infertile couple uh, around the world. Although I will say these uh, numbers are grossly underreported uh, because a lot of couples, especially males, uh, don't uh, go out and get examined or seek medical help. So uh, these numbers uh, are grossly underreported and this can be as, as high as four or 500 million uh, which will not be surprising. Um, male factor has been considered uh, to be about 25 to 30%. Uh, the female about 50% and both male and female are almost 20 to 25%. So if you look at all the causes of male infertility, it constitutes about half of all causes, 50% or close to 100 million. Now, in terms of the idiopathic, about half of these men have idiopathic infertility, uh, which is about 50 million. And in these patients, uh, in these patients, about 80% of them have oxidative stress. 
And if you look at the numbers, uh, these constitute about 50 million. And then even in patients who have varicocele or genetic causes or other type of uh, infertility related uh, reasons, uh, they're about uh, 30 to 40% 40, 40 of them have oxidative stress. So if you look at uh, idiopathic infertility, uh, about 65 million of these men have what we call as MOSI or male oxidative stress infertility. And these are the men who are candidates for antioxidant therapy. So let's learn about what is idiopathic male infertility. Well, uh, about half of the men with male infertility is what we call as idiopathic because we don't know what is going on in these men. Uh, the main characteristics of these uh, individuals are that they have poor semen quality without any identifiable cause. There are no uh, anatomical, there is no endocrine, there is no genetic causes that can be identified. And they have uh, abnormal oxidative stress or sperm DNA fragmentation results and there is no female factor. They have no female factor. This is what we call as idiopathic male infertility. Now, treatment for these men is empirical, means uh, it is a hit or miss. So there are a variety of treatments that have been uh, tried by physicians, but none of them have been uh, endorsed by any professional societies. There is very little or no randomized controlled studies to see the efficacy of these treatments, whether they are hormonal, whether it's Clomid, uh, SCG, androgen aromatase inhibitor, or SIRS, or uh, uh, any other type of treatment. So I believe that uh, this is the most poorly understood uh, causes where the treatment is essentially for half of the men with the male infertility, we don't know how to treat them. So everyone is trying different types of treatment. The patients are very frustrated. The physicians are very frustrated because they don't know what to do and they keep on trying. If it works in some, it doesn't work in other and the patient keep on going like circle and they spend a lot of money. They waste a lot of time and still the treatments uh, are not effective. Now, antioxidant is one of the treatment for these uh, men with idiopathic male infertility. So let's learn more. Um, so there has been a, a lot of uh, controversy about the role of antioxidant because some studies seem to show that they have an important role that they improve the quality of semen, even improve the pregnancy rate and uh, functional sperm parameters while others found no effect, no beneficial effect and they think that it's a waste of money. So what is uh, really the truth? How can we really identify whether they really have a role or not? And this is a problem because the literature is uh, really uh, unclear. And, uh, and even if there are meta-analysis, uh, whether it is by Cochrane or by other investigators, they really are based on the studies which are there in the literature. And most of the literature has small studies. Many of them are not very uh, strong studies, very uh, uh, powerful studies. And that uh, really causes uh, the problem in concluding uh, what is the truth of the role of antioxidants. So we conducted uh, this systematic review uh, to really try to see if we can, uh, if we can provide uh, some clarity. And we'll come back to that. Uh, but in terms of the beneficial effects of antioxidant, it is clear based on hundreds of studies that have been published on individual ingredients that are present. And uh, these are studies which have been conducted in the lab, um, in vitro studies, as well as in vivo studies using single, uh, single agent, uh, single compound like L-carnitine, or, uh, or for example, uh, coenzyme Q10, many studies have been conducted and they seem to show that uh, these molecules do have uh, beneficial effects uh, in terms of improving 
various sperm functions whether it is for motility whether improving the sperm concentration improving uh, uh, other parameters uh, such as uh, uh, dna uh, uh, remove uh, reducing the dna damage etc etc if they are given in correct dosage so there is a lot of good science which is available so what we found when we conducted our study the systematic review that uh, that majority of the studies seem and the yellow bar uh, indicate semen parameters and the orange bar are in, uh, showing sperm function so if you look at uh, the percentage of studies uh, which are examining the beneficial effects of antioxidant on sperm and sperm function parameters they show majority of studies about 90% of the studies in infertile men show improvement uh, in these parameters and whether it is uh, only looking at patients with abnormal semen quality again there is a significant improvement whether it is only looking at patients with idiopathic male infertility or unexplained infertility so across the board the literature supports uh, in terms of the studies that there is uh, a beneficial effects however however uh, there are so many controversies which continue in the minds of uh, uh, clinicians and uh, researchers and they keep on coming out in publications from time to time there are things that people say that there is a lack of randomized controlled uh, randomized placebo controlled studies that the antioxidants uh, are not effective and uh, which antioxidant should be used we don't know uh, what is the best marker to evaluate oxidative stress and uh, how long the antioxidant should be given what is the correct dose and the cost some people think that they are expensive when should we decide to change antioxidants so there are many many question and uh, and i think uh, this has become uh, a big uh, uh, problem in terms of uh, uh, allowing uh, the clinicians to have a clarity whether they can or should prescribe antioxidant for patients who have idiopathic male infertility so i wanted to show you a large number of double blind randomized controlled trials that are already published in the literature by many investigators from different parts of the world in high impact journal which shows that the antioxidants do provide significant advantage and beneficial effects so one of the criticism that people have is that there is no randomized controlled trial i believe that it is based on their ignorance they don't want to read the literature but there are a lot of double blind randomized controlled trial and they do show that uh, there is an improvement uh, based on different uh, types of antioxidants but they all show if you look at the bottom part improvement in quality of semen uh, whether it is improvement in pregnancy rate uh, or concentration so all of these studies and there are more these are additional studies and there may be more and they all show that there is an improvement in a variety of semen parameters in uh, patients uh, who have been treated with double blind uh, who have been uh, treated with antiox uh, antioxidant or uh, prescribed antioxidant uh, for 4 to 6 months and these uh, studies are double blind randomized controlled so let's talk about uh, what is male oxidative stress infertility or what we call as moci so let's learn first the oxidative stress what is oxidative stress not many people know very well so oxidative stress uh, is really uh, a very important uh, uh, change or condition uh, which uh, is uh, really involved in the etiology of male infertility or sperm dysfunction to understand very small quantities of these free radicals are necessary for uh, where uh, many uh, functions of the spermatozoa that prepare the sperm for the process of fertilization whether it is capacitation whether it is uh, acquisition of uh, sperm uh, motility or elasticity there are variety of changes that uh, happen to the sperm before they are ready to fertilize the egg 
whether it is in in vivo uh, condition or in vitro. So we need a small quantities of reactive oxygen species, very small quantities, or what we call as physiological quantities, uh, which uh, are necessary for normal fertilization to occur in vivo. That about uh, 30 to 80 percent of infertile men have high levels of these harmful reactive oxygen species. We know now that oxidative stress is really treatable. It can be treated successfully. And that uh, male reproductive potential really cannot be evaluated if we are not uh, looking at seminal oxidative stress. This is an important marker. It should be examined. However, there is no consensus at this time on how to measure oxidative stress uh, in terms of the diagnostic uh, uh, techniques and methods. So we propose the term male oxidative stress infertility or MOSI. And the diagram on the right uh, really shows uh, the procedure or the uh, mechanism of uh, oxidative stress. We have uh, endogenous or internal uh, a factor such as immature sperm, leukocytes, or pathological conditions such as varicocele, which can induce the production of free radicals. Then lifestyle factors such as fatty diet, smoking, alcohol, etc. Environmental pollutant like air pollution, pesticides, and then health conditions such as infection, testicular disease, and medication. These can all induce uh, the generation of reactive oxygen species. And this can really cause an imbalance between oxidant and antioxidant. So we published this uh, article, uh, which is a consensus document called Male Oxidative Stress Infertility, Proposed Terminology and Clinical Practice Guideline for the Management of Idiopathic Male Infertility. We invited uh, 90 authors, specialists from six country, six continents and 26 countries to join us uh, in developing these guidelines. And we published in a high impact journal called World Journal of Men's Health. And this was published uh, about two years ago. So let's talk about, now we know uh, that uh, there is a condition called MOSI. Uh, how do we really diagnose? So there is a device which uh, has become uh, available about uh, four or five years ago, and uh, we develop uh, the protocol and methodology and standardize this uh, for use in semen sample. Uh, it measures what we call as oxidation reduction potential, which is uh, really a snapshot of oxidant and antioxidants in the seminal fluid. And it's very easy to measure. Uh, it uses this uh, small device that you see on the right and with the sensor, uh, you put uh, a 30 microliter of uh, liquefied semen and uh, in three or four minutes, this sensor will provide you the results which will show up on the screen. No training is required. It's very simple, very easy and quite affordable. So we have uh, conducted large number of studies, uh, both uh, in the United States, as well as uh, studies which are multi-center. And uh, we have shown that uh, uh, there is a cutoff value which we have created or developed using the rock analysis of 1.34 millivolt per million sperm, uh, which is able to discriminate between patients who have abnormal oxidative stress versus normal oxidative stress or uh, something which is not pathological. And we conducted large number of studies in over 4,000 men. And on the bottom, you will see this uh, screen. The ORP values or oxidative stress values are very high in patients who have abnormal semen quality. Those who have normal semen quality, uh, the values of ORP is very, very low. So the cutoff value is developed uh, in, uh, in a very large number of men. And we registered this uh, as a trademark uh, as, uh, and we are offering this uh, uh, test to our patients uh, for the last five, six years. So what is the algorithm? We propose this in our publication, which is available uh, online through PubMed or other, you can Google it. Uh, so we advise the patient undergoes even analysis at the same time, they can be tested for oxidative stress 
And if the ORP values are high or abnormal, then we know that there is oxidative stress. There are many of the conditions that can happen. Oxidative stress can be combined with uh, infection or inflammation, then they can be treated with antibiotic along with the antioxidant. If there are no other uh, risk factor or comorbidities, then they can undergo antioxidant uh, supplementation for four to six months and then retest it for uh, oxidative stress. If they're lifestyle factors, then they can be counseled and then retested. If they're varicocele, then they can be operated and retested. So this is what we describe as the algorithm. In terms of the clinical guideline, MOSI should be suspected in infertile men with abnormal semen quality and oxidative stress. These men are classified as idiopathic with no underlying endocrine, genetic, or anatomical causes and no female factor. And these men are good candidate for oxidative stress and to potentially diagnose MOSI. Let's talk about uh, a large uh, survey, global survey that we conducted recently and published uh, this year of reproductive specialists to determine the clinical utility of oxidative stress testing and antioxidant use in male infertility. So it, it is uh, a, a, a online survey that we conducted uh, around the world. And these are the results which have been published. The goal of this was to really look at um, the use of antioxidant for male infertility and uh, oxidative stress testing based on expert clinicians in the field of infertility. Um, we wanted to conduct this survey because there are no established guidelines about the use of antioxidant. And there is a significant contribution of oxidative stress as I showed uh, to male infertility. Uh, and there is a common use of antioxidant that uh, some people are taking even without uh, prescription for management of infertile men. Our methods uh, was uh, that we had an expert team. Uh, we created an online survey and using the internet, we sent it to uh, a large number of uh, 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 clinicians around the world and uh, gave them the chance to complete this anonymously. So the questionnaire included four questions related to demographics of a participant, profession, and clinical practice, uh, question related to oxidative stress, and then more importantly, use of antioxidant in clinical practice. We had uh, um, a very large participation of over 1,300 participants uh, from 88 countries in this survey. And uh, in terms of the demographic, most uh, were young uh, between the ages of 35 to 44. A majority of them from Asia. Most were attending physician, about 60%. And uh, about 61% uh, had over 10 years of experience. And uh, uh, about half of them had a special training in male infertility. And uh, about 35% uh, had private practice. Uh, in terms of the main profession, a uh, majority of them were uh, urologists, and then there were uh, andrologists, gynecologists, and other profession. Um, and more than one of, uh, many of them were registered in more than one profession. So let's look at um, the, the response regarding the use of oxidative stress biomarkers in clinical evaluation. Majority of them, about 65% of them, do not use oxidative stress as part of male infertility evaluation, which is not surprising uh, because the oxidative stress testing is not uh, widely known. And certainly the, the, the device and uh, method uh, has not been wid widely understood by many people. And, uh, and I think this is something that uh, will change over a course of time. The, the most commonly ordered test to evaluate oxidative stress was found to be a uh, is sperm DNA fragmentation. About 53% uh, of them uh, uses DNA fragmentation testing and the rest uh, a variety of tests uh, which are described here. In terms of the indications for testing, uh, what we found that in terms of the clinical condition, uh, abnormal semen quality was considered as the major uh, reason than unexplained male infertility, uh, high oxidative, high sperm DNA fragmentation results, uh, and uh, then 
other conditions such as idiopathic male infertility, varicocele, etc. And then in terms of the lifestyle factors, uh, uh, smoking or alcohol consumption was the major cause in about 74%. Advanced uh, uh, age of the men was in 66%. Then other causes was exposure to high temperature, etc. In terms of the prescription of antioxidant, about 85% uh, prescribe uh, um, uh, these antioxidant uh, uh, for male infertility, although a small number, about 14% never. For management of a specific condition, 96% prescribe for certain condition, and the most common are uh, due to risk factor for oxidative stress, idiopathic oligosthenoteratosis, permia, unexplained male infertility, and abnormal semen quality. In terms of the duration, majority of them uh, give it for about three months, and, uh, and about 40% of them for three to six months, and uh, a small proportion of them for more than six months. So we think uh, uh, anywhere between three to six months is appropriate. The most commonly prescribed antioxidant were uh, um, these four or five of them, those which have uh, zinc, vitamin E, L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10, and vitamin C. Uh, in terms of the types of uh, antioxidant uh, products, the most common uh, which have been reported was Proxeed Plus, um, then others uh, which are described here. The reasons for prescribing the antioxidant was mainly scientific evidence uh, is the main driver, personal experience, relevant knowledge, and then uh, other uh, reasons for recommending. Um, then not prescribing, which is a smaller number of, uh, of uh, survey participants, lack of scientific evidence, unfamiliar with the field, personal experience and others. So this is a small number of uh, uh, a survey participant who do not prescribe. In terms of the strength of evidence regarding use of antioxidant, 20% think the evidence is strong. Half of them have reported the evidence is modest and others say that uh, really the studies or the literature lack good evidence. In terms of the limitations, most uh, say that the uh, cost is a big limitation. And second most common is the long time therapy postponing uh, treatments for ART uh, because the patients are on antioxidant. In terms of the endpoints uh, to be measured after antioxidant use and the need for guideline, um, I believe that uh, most of these physicians believe that uh, standard semen analysis, uh, sperm DNA fragmentation, clinical and ongoing pregnancy, live birth rate are the most relevant endpoints that they would like to see. And uh, they definitely believe uh, the need for uh, uh, anti uh, the guidelines for use of antioxidant. So we conducted uh, some uh, other studies and uh, we are going to talk about that uh, in terms of uh, antioxidants uh, clinical trials. So this was a clinical trial that we conducted, uh, which was a prospective clinical trial with about 150 infertile men. Mo majority of them were idiopathic and we gave them antioxidant three tablets twice daily for three months with a compound called FH uh, Pro uh, for men. It's uh, by one of the uh, company here in the United States called Fair Heaven Health. And we measured uh, routine semen parameters from WHO fifth edition 2010 guidelines, as well as uh, parameters for oxidative stress, such as ORP and sperm DNA fragmentation. And uh, we found that uh, majority of these men with idiopathic infertility, they have oxidative stress or MOSI. So majority of idiopathic men are actually also having oxidative stress, so they fall into the category of uh, MOSI. And these are the results. These are outstanding results, which we think after six months of treatment, we saw that the, uh, the yellow bar is before treatment with antioxidant, and the green bar is after the treatment. And these are different parameters 
of the semen. We saw about 55% uh, increase in sperm concentration, uh, a good increase in motility, almost 150% increase in progressive motility, which is really very important uh, uh, parameter of the sperm, much more important than just total motility. Furthermore, we saw 86% increase in normal morphology, a significant decline, almost 40% in oxidative stress and decline uh, in uh, the poor uh, sperm DNA fragmentation by almost 21%. So all of these uh, values are very, very good. We also saw an increase in the spontaneous pregnancy rate in the follow-up that we were able to conduct. We conducted another study which is uh, to look at uh, what really is uh, uh, really causing these changes in the semen quality of men who are given antioxidants. So we conducted a study to look at the molecular uh, changes that are happening, which really results in improvement that we see. No such study has been conducted in the world, uh, which uh, really examines uh, the molecular changes at the, at, the, at the level of proteins and genes. So we conducted this study and these are the results. We found after antioxidant treatment in Cleveland Clinic uh, that there are several proteins which uh, show significant increase after antioxidant supplementation. And these are the results uh, of those protein using Western blot, which shows that important proteins uh, which uh, are responsible for oxidative phosphorylation and free radical scavenging uh, are significantly increased. This is the protein called NDUFS. And proteins uh, which are responsible for sperm binding to the zona pellucida is significantly increased after antioxidant. Opicaria 1, which is a protein which is responsible for sperm motility, is significantly increased. And these are important findings, first time in the world we have shown that antioxidant supplementation has beneficial effect on sperm function protein associated with fertility at the molecular level. Really, it is a fantastic findings. So whether antioxidant and male infertility now after listening to our reports, our lecture, is it a fact or it is a fiction? Well, the, 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 the fiction is here which says few antioxidant trials have been published. Not true. Many, many randomized controlled trials and some are, uh, are unblinded and many uncontrolled studies have been published. Uh, then there are, uh, there are uh, controversies or people who claim that there are no multi-center study that we need thousands of patients. This really is impractical because antioxidants uh, are very cheap uh, products. Um, and they are made by companies which are not large pharmaceutical companies. They cannot uh, really afford uh, large scale studies. Uh, the sponsorship or uh, funding for such studies is impractical. Actually, in the field of infertility, you will never find very large scale uh, studies, uh, even uh, for any kind of diseases. Placebo controlled studies are not there, which is uh, actually are not possible because we cannot really deny treatment to patient by putting them on placebo. This is unethical. Other causes that length of treatment with antioxidant is not uh, really well described. This is wrong because majority of the studies have shown that a treatment for three to six months is really most beneficial. And then you see a lot of uh, other uh, type of controversy people seem to claim which are really not based on facts. These are personal opinion of people who are very biased. And uh, then you see that pregnancy and live birth should be evaluated. Uh, this is really not practical because uh, pregnancy is, uh, is a multifactorial condition which is uh, taking into uh, account the, the female uh, reproductive function, uh, the, the age, the, the oocyte, the actual uh, 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 actual health of uh, the female uh, reproduction. And these uh, are not just because of the male uh, gamete. So to, to really ask for uh, showing the results in pregnancy and live birth uh, is a very high bar and most studies will fail 
in any kind of uh, diseases. And that there are no molecular basis of antioxidant treatment, this is wrong because we have clearly shown and published in high impact journal our finding that uh, provides the basis for why we are seeing improvement in many of these parameters. And this is a meta-analysis that we are conducting right now and uh, about to publish based on very rigorous uh, type of uh, study that we have conducted uh, from uh, all over the world. And this shows, this shows, if you look at that majority of the studies favor antioxidant when it comes to uh, not only uh, uh, semen parameters, but also natural pregnancy outcome. If you look at the clinical pregnancy, they are significantly showing improvement in patients favoring antioxidant use. This will be published soon in a high impact journal. So what are the indications for treatment with antioxidant? These are some of the indication, repeated failure of IUI or IVF. Patients who have been diagnosed with uh, varicocele, stage two, grade two, grade three, clinical varicocele. Older men, history of infection, smoking, idiopathic infertility, and recurrent spontaneous abortion. These are some of the conditions where you can really prescribe antioxidant. To conclude, antioxidant use should be recommended in patients with MOSI, and this is a very large population. About 56 million men and many couples have this condition, which they are not really aware because the physicians do not know what is MOSI and do not know how to diagnose or treat. There is a proven efficacy in large number of studies, which I've shown. There is a lack of side effects. It's very inexpensive. If you look at the treatment cost of antioxidant uh, cycle is a few hundred dollars compared to a failed IVF, which can be in this country, almost 20,000 US dollar. And, uh, and to, to deny treatment with antioxidant for patients who are undergoing failure of assisted reproduction, is really, I think, very, very bad. So we need high quality studies for sure. I think in every field we need such studies, not only with the treatment for antioxidant. So the take home message is best duration minimum of three months or between three to six months. Best antioxidant, this is for each person, each physician to decide because as they say, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. What I will feel is uh, really good. Maybe you will not feel that is good. So you have to read the literature, look at uh, what is available, what is good, what you feel is uh, providing the best results and make your own decision. But in the end, you need best ingredients. So it is better to have a cocktail of uh, antioxidant in the formulation rather than a single agent. So in general, we agree antioxidant which have all these ingredients such as vitamin E, C, L-carnitine, acetylcarnitine, coenzyme Q10, zinc, selenium, folic acid, lycopene, etc., are providing the best outcome results in patients who have, who have uh, a idiopathic male infertility and MOSI. MOSI means uh, they have male oxidative stress infertility. And what is MOSI? abnormal semen quality, no other anatomical endocrine genetic causes uh, and no female factor. These are patients we call as MOSI. So in these patients, we believe if the antioxidants are being given after proper diagnostic uh, uh, analysis with the uh, measurement of uh, oxidative stress, uh, you will find very high success rate. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you. Uh, dear Professor uh, Agarwal, thank you very much for this very nice presentation on the extremely important topic for the oxidative stress and male infertility, showing dramatic improvement in salmon parameters and, fun and uh, quality. So now it's time for the questions from the audience. Someone from the audience who wants to ask Professor Agarwal? Okay, 
We have a question from the audience. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for this wonderful lecture. Um, uh, it has been very um, educative. I would just want to ask if um, does it this antioxidant do they benefit to the female patients as well? Um, thank you very much. If I understand, you are asking if these antioxidants uh, could help uh, the female patients as well. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the female uh, anatomy and physiology is very different than, uh, uh, than the male. Uh, so yes, uh, um, there are uh, studies that have been conducted. Uh, many studies have been conducted uh, looking at the role of antioxidant in female. Uh, however, many of these studies are still not very conclusive or the number of studies that have been conducted have been far smaller. Not many clinical trials have been conducted. There is a limited amount of data uh, in terms of the female uh, patients and the role of antioxidant, just because uh, there are many, many conditions or factors uh, which uh, can interfere in uh, really telling us if the antioxidant are truly working in the female. In the male, we have uh, easier uh, way because uh, we can study the semen parameters. We can look at uh, the changes that are occurring. But in the female, uh, uh, to, to really examine, uh, you really don't have any easy uh, biological fluid uh, that can be examined. So people have looked at the follicular fluid. People have looked at um, uh, during the IVF or peritoneal fluid or, or uh, culture uh, during the uh, during the IVF uh, into the culture media. So there are many studies that have been conducted, uh, but the studies are still under power. Few studies are there. So the, there is a lot more work that needs to be done. Although there are companies which are, which are really selling uh, antioxidant uh, for women, uh, but the, the science is not uh, very good. It's not mature. For, uh, for us to really recommend routinely uh, antioxidant, specifically for treatment of infertility uh, in the woman at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you.